I will need your assistance in the future to make sure I start the recording early enough. So again, we're looking at the categories of the fools and we had the simple or brutish as it's used in Proverbs 12, one, whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. Then we have uh, the silly or the stupid or simple. And one way to, to, to describe it is that there's no substance to them. They're easily taken off course if they have one, but they are teachable. They can learn and scripture tells us that because these are the ones that are said to benefit from punishment or dealing with the perverse fools. So we see in Proverbs 27, 12, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. This is somebody who doesn't grasp the obvious. The prudent man sees evil. He, he's walking along the road. He sees the lion at the side of the road and he turns and goes another direction. The simple is just in his own world, walking down the road. Maybe he's singing, daydreaming, and doesn't see the threat and continues. Now that's a simple example, but that's the idea that these are people who just aren't aware, easily distracted. Um, one of the philosophers called them seducible. They're the ones that the scam artists can take advantage of. Oh, yes, the, uh, they present the contrast. Quite a few in Proverbs are done that way. And what was that, the title for that, Marismus? Oh, okay. And it is certainly a common technique in the Proverbs to present them as the contrast that they are. Um, the next one we have is uh, described as persistently unethical. Many of the commentators call this one vile. And they cling to their folly because of hardened hearts. So they have hardened their hearts against God. And we see in uh, Proverbs 17, 7, excellent speech becometh not a fool, must, much less do the do lying lips a prince. Uh, another way of look, saying this is flowery speech doesn't make a fool look any better. So although he could speak well, his argument is empty. And probably it's an argument being made for a bad cause because this person is described as vile. This one is unethical. And so the fact that they speak well is not sufficient to endorse them to you. Makes me think of some politicians. They can, they can talk a great line, but there's nothing there that's going to be beneficial. The next one is uh, Strong's 191. This one despises intelligent, intelligence, depth of knowledge or wisdom and are arrogant about it. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And that's what this word is. They, <clears throat> they want to get out of class. They don't even want to be in school, especially not if the Lord is teaching. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but they despise wisdom and instruction. These are the ones that some of the verses tell you, don't argue with them because you'll look foolish.
The last one we have is the scorner who scoffs at wisdom and rejects the opportunity to be wise. They reject the opportunity to learn God's truth and know it and apply it. They just don't want to have anything to do with it. Proverbs 15, 12. A scorner loveth not the one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. So a scorner is not going to appreciate your attempts to show them the way or to correct them. They don't want any part of it. Now, as we talk about these, I'm sure if you think back, you can see times in your life, I know I can, when I have acted in some of these ways. And I think that uh, a few years before I was saved, I would have fallen in the last category because I worked at the Pentagon and there was a captain in our agency who tried to witness to me regularly. And I finally told him I didn't want to hear it because his God was capricious and I just didn't have any use for it. So I think I was, I was either despising intelligence and wisdom or I was scoffing, but I was, that's where I was. And I remember to this day actually telling him that I thought his God was capricious. Yes, ma'am. I have not had the opportunity to see him because I did not come to the Lord for about another five years. And I was only in the army for three. And he left the Pentagon before my tour was over. And I lost touch with him. Do not know. So never had that opportunity. But I do remember that he spoke to me regularly and he had the opportunity because I was on the exercise support team, which meant I was in the command post in the Pentagon. But occasionally they practice for what happens if the Pentagon gets blown up. We need to move people or, or may get blown up because it's targeted. You know, the Pentagon is five sided. Well, in the very center, they have a hamburger stand. And although it's not called this, when we worked there, everybody referred to it as the Ground Zero Cafe, because we were sure the Soviets had multiple nukes targeted to the top of that hamburger stand. So as a result, military policy is to disperse command to alternate sites, and you practice that during exercises. Well, I was in the <clears throat> Army Operations Center. Uh, which is, you know, where you see the colonels gathered to prepare all the information for the generals with the big computer screens and all the maps. And they're down on the floor and the generals are like up in the balcony of the Glastian room, which is a big conference room. So they can see all of this as the briefer is talking and pointing to the displays. Well, that was the agency I worked for. And we would have to go to other places to prepare if we were relocated. And so this captain and I traveled on several occasions. And when we didn't fly in helicopters, we drove or rode on buses. So I was kind of a captive audience for him to speak to. And at every opportunity he did. I believe that some of it actually got through to me, but it took a while. But so I saw myself before I came to salvation in this category. So as we look at these people being described in Proverbs, you may see some characteristics that peek through every once in a while, or you may see some that you recognize from your past and gratefully, thank God, we've gotten past some of that. But there are others who haven't. And so we have the opportunity to recognize what scripture is telling us and to be able to do something about it when we speak. Let me make sure I haven't missed anything I wanted to say. Ooh. 
Yeah, I have a little bit more of a description for some of these uh, uh, characteristics. Um, I'll work my way back through the list. Uh, scorners would be described as conceited, arrogant people, um, free thinkers, indifferent or skeptical to religion, and too self-opinionated to be open to advice or correction. Was that me, babe? Ah, uh, yeah, you can say so. <laughs> so I'm using myself as an example rather than trying to use you, but uh, yes, I was definitely arrogant and self-opinionated. Working backwards, the, the one who despises intelligence, they are so far from attaining true wisdom that they despise it. It's, it's not just that they don't want to hear it. They despise the truth of God. And it could well be they are so opposed to God that they don't want to know him and fear him. Um, the unethical or vile, especially when we talked about his speech, <clears throat> this is a vicious fool and makes it known when he flaunts his lack of wisdom before others. That's what the eloquent speech is talking about. This is somebody who doesn't know enough not to open their mouth and reveal that they're a fool. Um, the silly or stupid, they just blunder their way through. And there's a Cornish proverb that talks about this. It says, he who will not be ruled by the rudder must be ruled by the rock. That means if the rudder can't guide him, he's going to run aground. So you can either let the rudder push you the right way, or you can let the rock stop you. And that's the, the silly or the stupid one. Simple is probably simple and naive is probably the way I most consider that person. So we're getting close. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at ways to stop being foolish because we want to consider the application as we study what scripture says about these, because what's the point if we don't do something with it, if we don't allow God to work in us? And the first way is don't become a fool by failing to take personal accountability or responsibility for wrong attitudes or bad conduct. Conduct. Says this is the classic blame shifting maneuver. Not my fault. Was it? Uh, is it Family Circus has that little ghost like character? Not me. Who did it? Not me. Not me. Not. And it doesn't just start out in Proverbs. Um, in Genesis, Adam blamed God and Eve. You put the woman here with me. It's your fault, God. Adam ate of the fruit because God put the woman there. And she's also at fault because she gave him the fruit from the tree. All Adam did was eat it. Blame shifting started with Adam. So you, you know it's a technique that has plenty of historical development. It began with Adam. And then Eve said, no, not me. The servant deceived me and I ate. So we have blame shifting starting with Adam and Eve. And there's a proverb 19.3 that talks about this. A man's own folly ruins his life, 
yet his heart rages against the Lord. Now, this is the evil, perverse one. This is Strong's 200. So it's saying that his own perversion and behavior has ruined his life. But he doesn't take responsibility for it. His heart rages against the Lord. God, why have you done this to me? This is the attitude that sometimes you see presented when somebody says, I'm a Christian, why are these things happening to me? And quite often, it has nothing to do with whether you're saved or not. It has to do with the consequences of your prior behavior, which are not removed by salvation. We still live in this world. If we've created bad relationships, if we've committed crimes, you know, somebody who's committed serious crime and is in prison is not going to be released from prison just because they've been saved. And railing against the Lord because you're in those situations is exactly what this one is talking about. And this is someone who is perverse in their understanding. They have ruined their lives through their own behavior, through their own folly, and yet they're angry at God for it. Well, that's understandable because otherwise it becomes necessary to admit that I was the fool. I was the one who was perverted. I was the one whose decisions and behavior brought this about. And realistically, the only way somebody's going to acknowledge that is if they come to the Lord. Because before that, they're going to fight against it. And so that's the behavior that we see there, that one way we can avoid foolish behavior is to take responsibility for the things that we do. And if necessary, apologize, correct it, go to the Lord in prayer and ask for forgiveness and for guidance to avoid it in the future. No, but I'd say that's the only way, Dave. Wait a minute. No, no, no. The first thing is, it's not my fault. Since it's not my fault, how do I get out of it? <laughs> oh, so you know it's your fault and you just want to avoid the consequences. We will keep it secret and hidden. But... If we're to avoid foolish behavior on our part, one of the ways we can do it is to take responsibility and be personally accountable for the actions and the decisions that we make, for the things we say, for the way we treat people. Those are all things under our control as far as our behavior. And if it's not the behavior that we know it should be, and then the way to change it is to go to the Lord, spend time in scripture. And in this case, recognizing that that's what's happening. If it's a behavior that someone has and they are now made aware of it, you can pay attention for it. You can pray each day that God will make you aware and you can avoid those behaviors. So one way to avoid foolish behavior is to be accountable for what you do. Okay, this one may hit close to home, but we need to, to be honest about it. Don't be a fool whose mouth gushes derogatory comments about others. Now that's putting it pretty harshly. But the point is, some people find it easy to speak poorly of others, even to the point of lying or spreading false reports. Um, 
And whatever the reason, God calls this the slanderer a fool. And Proverbs 10, 18 talks about this. One who conceals hatred has lying lips, and one who spreads slander is a fool. And that one is uh, 3684, which is one of the lesser evil fools. This is someone who could be trained out of that behavior, disciplined out. So Proverbs is telling us that this is a behavior that is the action of a fool, but this is the type of fool who can be taught, disciplined, or trained. So this is behavior that we can overcome. Um, and I'm sorry. Even one false report can severely damage a person's reputation. So we should be aware of that, yes. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room who has done that on occasion, uh, like at lunch today. It happens, but we can avoid making derogatory comments. And probably it's easiest to start with those that we make about people we have regular contact with because those are the ones that we are most likely to damage. My comments about a national politician at lunch are very unlikely to cause serious consequences in that person's life. I probably shouldn't be doing it, but they're not going to cause consequences. But if we say things about people that we know, family, neighbors, people at church, that will have an impact because we are much closer to them. And the point is that Proverbs is saying that one who spreads slander is a fool. Uh, this is the fool who is a simpleton, who's arrogant about it and maybe delights in not understanding just you know i'm happy i don't need to know you know ignorance is bliss i don't know any better so i don't have to worry about it but god is telling us here in proverbs 10 18 that that's foolish behavior So since I didn't start the recording early enough, I'm going to finish tonight uh, rereading some of the quotes so that they're on the Zoom recording for others. And I'm going to start with Benjamin Franklin, who said, wise men don't need advice and fools won't take it. And then Plato, which is one of my favorites, wise men speak because they have something to say fools because they have to say something. And finally, uh, Woodrow Kroll, who said, only a fool thinks he can fool God. So as we uh, draw to a close tonight, any comments or thoughts that you want to share before we finish? Anybody on Zoom have any comments or questions? Uh, seeing none, all the microphones are still muted. We'll go ahead and close for this evening. And uh, Fred, would you close us with a word of prayer? And my apologies to those of you on Zoom. I forgot that you cannot hear prayer in the room. I will make sure that 
I say the closing prayer in the future. So I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you so much. Thank you All very right. much. Very, very good, Brother Gary. Thank you. Night, okay. everyone. Night. Thank you, good Gary. Night. Good night, night and be Already. careful about how foolish you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a real problem, I think. <laughs> good one. Good night. All right, good, good night. Night, night. night.